everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Andy Dickus. Uh, I work at the ANA here in Colorado Springs. Welcome to our eLearning Academy. Um, and we'd like to thank the, uh, uh, the Gray Sheet for their continued sp uh, uh, support and sponsorship of our eLearning program. Today we have Phil, uh, Phil Vitale here from the Albuquerque Coin Club. Phil is a very active numismatist in, in Albuquerque and across the country. Uh, he has uh, done numerous uh, e-learning presentations for our program here. And uh, today we've got kind of a special treat, Lewis and Clark, a lasting numismatic legacy. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting started. And without further, further delay, Phil, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay, everybody can see my wage foot slide, right? Yes. All right. I think it so, really good. Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, back in 2019 at the uh, National Money Show, there was a presentation by Rob Throckmorton and Dick Gitano, and um, they did a presentation on Lewis and Clark, and it was sort of focused on uh, the story of the expedition from, from the Pennsylvania area. It was very good, but I thought that there was more story to tell. So I built this presentation, and uh, I had talked to them. They let me use their pictures from, uh, for a, an article I published, and we'll see if uh, I provide you with a little bit more information. So back in 1803, Thomas Jefferson was interested in buying the port of New Orleans from the French. And he was willing to, to pay $10 million of it to gain access to the drainage of the Mississippi River. He was surprised to find out that Napoleon was willing to offer the whole of the territory for about $15 million. Um, all of that territory uh, ended up being about 828,000 square miles. And the uh, Western boundary was the drainage of the Mississippi. The actual transfer didn't occur until the end of the year. Uh, Congress approved the deal in October of 1803, uh, but there was a little hiccup. Uh, it wasn't touted by Napoleon when he signed the, the paperwork. Spain had ceded this territory to France a couple of years earlier with the caveat that it wasn't to be sold. Bonaparte needed the money to uh, finance his wars in Europe. And he broke the agreement, but took the money anyway. And Spain believed that the territory should be theirs. And they tried to stop the exploration by the Americans. And we'll hear more about that in a couple of minutes. So uh, Jefferson was anxious to establish an American president, presidency and sort of figure out where the boundary of this new expansive uh, territory he bought was. Uh, he actually chartered three expeditions in the mid 1800s. Uh, the Corps of Discovery, which is Lewis and Clark, which is the most extensive. Uh, the Red River expedition in 1806 and the Pike Expedition in 1806 and 1807. Um, let's see. Oh, so you can tell inflation has really hit us. Uh, Congress approved $2,324 to provision um, the Lewis and Clark Expedition with food and, and supplies. The uh, Spanish Viceroy heard about this and tried to intercept the expedition, but missed them by a week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the keelboat, which is a good picture over here, um, it was constructed near Pittsburgh in August of 1800 and was floated down river and taken to St. Louis, where the official kickoff for the expedition started. 
So the Corps of Discovery had a number of objectives. Um, it was to explore and map the territory, which is a big deal. Find a route across the West. Um, a really big deal was establishing an American presence and studying the flora and fauna because um, they didn't know what was out there and hopefully establish a trade with the native tribes. Now, at the bottom of this slide uh, is a Jefferson Peace Medal. And uh, these medals are actually minted in bronze and silver and gold. Um, the Friendship Medals are still available on eBay and really not too much, I'm surprised. <laughs> So, okay, so who were the key players in this core of discovery? Well, obviously, Captain Meriwether Lewis, he was a captain in the Virginia militia, and uh, he was a hunter and an outdoorman, and Jefferson's personal secretary. Jefferson put a lot of trust in him. Clark, was commissioned as a captain in the Indiana militia in 1790. His older brothers were high-ranking uh, officers in the Revolutionary War, but he resigned his commission in 1796. Um, but he went back into another militia and was a lieutenant in 1803 when he was recruited by Lewis. They knew each other from the Whiskey Rebellion of 1791 through 1794, and uh, they held each other in pretty hard, uh, pretty high regard. It's sort of a turn of fate that Clark was Lewis's commanding officer for a time. Uh, certainly more interesting is Sacagawea. She was kidnapped from her tribe when she was 12. Her French Canadian trapper husband. And I use that term husband very loosely, was Toussaint Charbonneau, who either or won her about three years later. She was six months pregnant when they encountered Lucy Park in North Dakota and gave birth to a son, Jean Baptiste, February 11th, 1805. She had been hired by Lewis and Park as an interpreter, not a guide but in many ways saved their bacon throughout the whole expedition. So here's the timeline. Uh, the official start of the expedition from St. Louis was on May 14th, 1804. They wintered in North Dakota uh, the winter of 1804 to 1805, uh, where they met Sacagawea and her Canadian fur trapper husband. Um, they departed that fort that they had built in 1805 and in April of 1805, and they reached the Pacific Ocean in November. Um, their return trip started back in March of 1806, and they were very happy to get out of there because of the deprivation they suffered. And they managed to arrive back in St. Louis in one piece in uh, September of 1806. Uh, oh, the, on the return journey, if you look at this map, you notice that the red line splits uh, north and round in Montana arena. So the group split on the return journey with Lewis leading north through Montana and Clark following the Yellowstone River to the south. And they were the first known white men to see the wonders of today's Yellowstone National Park. Overall, their expedition was a really great success. Um, thousands of maps, descriptions of flora and fauna were detailed. Uh, lots of previously unknown peoples were contacted. Um, a 
presence in this region was established and the unwar unclaimed <clears throat> Northwest territory territories were explored. Uh, the expedition lost only one man, uh, Sergeant Floyd, to acute appendicitis. So the picture of the bird that you see on the right of the screen is a Lewis woodpecker seen at my home in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Um, and if it had been drier instead of raining when I took that picture, it would really stand out. So, when looking into history books, I don't see any record of any celebrations of Lewis and Clark in the 1800s. However, the early 1900s, <clears throat> excuse me, saw an explosion of Lewis and Clark interest and celebration. Um, this bison note is a favorite of collectors and it's actually, I have one of 40 and it's a, it's a favorite of mine as well. But you notice the little vignettes, uh, Mary Weather Lewis and uh, John Clark. Um, and I have never seen anything quite like it before in my life. Anyway, um, by the way, there were thousands, a lot of thousands of this note made, but there's only three to four and a half thousand known to exist today in all uh, categories, all rates. In 1904, <clears throat> there was a Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, where they celebrated the the, uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition and the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. And we have Jefferson and Napoleon on the official souvenir coin. I think that the backside of this coin is just absolutely outstanding. Um, and once again, you can find these on eBay. Um, the brass variety is only like about 55 bucks. It's amazingly cheap. Uh, this metal was also, uh, or souvenir was also made in several different metals. In 1905 in Portland, Oregon, they had a Lewis and Clark Centennial Expo Exposition. Um, the guys in Portland really did this up right. Uh, the Mint created this $1 coin with Lewis on one side and Clark on the other. And it actually was minted in 1904 and 1905. There was about 10,000 of them made in each year. And if you want to buy an MS-63, it's going to cost you $1,000 plus for this little coin. But it is really an outstanding little coin. Additionally, they had several tokens. Um, I was really surprised. There's uh, obviously either they were giving these away or you could pick them up for a nominal cost. Um, but as you can see, Portland, Oregon is a uh, the hot spot of Lewis and Clark in 1905. So. Okay, all quiet for another hundred years. And the dawn of the 21st century brought renewed interest in Lewis and Clark. So in 2000, we saw the introduction of the Sacagawea dollar coin. The treasury was looking for a coin to replacement for the $1 bill after the Susan B. Anthony failure. Uh, coin advisory board selected this design from those that were submitted in a competition. Sacagawea is shown with, shown with her son, Jean Baptiste, on her back. And I'm always astounded that she managed to carry that baby all over northwestern United States. So I'm really pleased to say that this Sacagawea coin has a New Mexico connection. 
The designer is Glenda Goodacre, and her studio was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she died just a few months ago. The model is Randy L. Teton, who's a Shoshone woman, just like uh, Sacagawea was, and happens to be a UNM, University of New Mexico graduate, uh, at the time that she modeled for this coin. And in 2008, uh, she, we paid for her to come by one of our, our coin shows. And there was a group of Navajo coin talkers at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center for a different gathering. And when they heard that she was over by us, they all came over enabling this picture to be taken. A lot of these guys aren't with us anymore, unfortunately. So following up on the uh, bicentennial, the 2003 Missouri State Quarter featured the core of discovery. Um, doesn't quite look like a keel, but you have the idea. Uh, in 2004, Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Dollar was struck. This is the uncirculated. Um, an interesting thing, they made hundred and forty-two thousand uncirculated of these coins, but they made three hundred and fifty-two thousand in proof. Consequently, I looked it up, I didn't believe it. The uncirculated exa examples go for about 18% more than the proofs. So, um, the Red Book has this coin for 35 bucks, but the proof one for 30. You figure it. In addition, the mint struck two special nickels in 2004. They had uh, the, the Jefferson uh, obverse and the keelboat on one of them and the peace medal on the other. And you've seen that peace medal before, right? It came with the, um, the supplies for the Lewis and Clark expedition. The next year, the Mint issued another couple of nickels with a special obverse, uh, a depiction of Jefferson not seen before. And the first nickel is the words from uh, Meriwether Lewis's journal. It says, Ocean in view. Oh, the joy and uh they were they were pretty happy to see the ocean they didn't know that wintering there would be miserable because of the infestation of black flies and other pests plus the fact that they damn near uh, starved to death uh they also issued a nickel with a bison on the back of it obviously this is not like the uh Buffalo nickel that we've seen from the 1930s. But it really is a nice coin. Uh, and uh, Clark's part of the expedition on the way home saw lots and lots of these animals. And it's the first place where it was recorded. So before we go to questions, I want to make mention of the two ex other expeditions that were launched in the 1800s. I probably should have talked about this at the beginning. So in 1806, the Red River Expedition was launched and it went 615 miles up river before it was intercepted by the Spanish and turned around. In the same year, and to um, 1807, the Pike Expedition was launched, and 
you guys have heard of Zebulon Pike or Pike's Peak. Um, I think these guys were a little bit out of field. Anyway, they were intercepted by the Spanish and uh, either, if you want to call them intercepted or rescued by the Spanish, because they were really, really in bad shape. And after, after the Spanish saved them, gave them food and water, et cetera, they get, got uh, sent packing back to the US of A. Okay. I, are we going to do questions via the chat, Andy? Yeah, let's, uh, oh, wait a minute here. Does anybody have any questions for Phil? You can put them in the chat or the Q&A if you'd like. I have just a couple of comments, Phil, just kind of some, uh, some interesting. Um, regarding uh, the Sacagawea, um, uh, Randy Delha Teton, I believe is her name. Randy uh, L. Teton, yes. Yes, uh, she actually, the, the woman who served for the model for the Sacagawea uh, coin, uh, actually was an intern here at the ANA. Uh, after she uh, was the model for that. I never got a chance to meet her. It was, uh, it was before I got here, but just kind of an interesting tidbit. And then uh, the designer of the Sacagawea dollar, uh, Glenna Goodacre, is, uh, well, she passed away a year or two ago, um, but she was a graduate of Colorado College. And as many of you know, we're here in Colorado Springs. The ANA headquarters is actually located on the campus of Colorado College. And before she died, uh, through uh, someone who was kind of uh, caring for her, uh, for her studio in New Mexico, he gave us a large donation of stuff pertaining to the Sacagawea dollar, uh, galvanos, uh, plaster molds, uh, sketches, all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's actually a really interesting um, donation that I kind of work with. And I put it on our M Money Museum blog on money.org if you want to learn more about that. Okay, it looks like maybe we have a, a chat or two. Yeah. Um, here, here's one, Phil. Can you explain the difference, if any, between the pieces provided to the designer and those in mint sets? Uh, I can't. I can't authoritatively. Um, this is provided to the... No, I just... I just do not know. Um, the, the year 2000, um, they produced a tremendous amount of Sacagawea coins, golden dollars, as they were called. And um, I honestly can't tell the difference between the very fresh circulating coins and the proofs. So I don't know if there was any, uh, any other. Well, I would assume they, they put the Sacagawea dollar in the 2000 just regular proof sets if it's a circulating coin. Yeah. Um, so, so I would assume proofs were made and then they would look di different with the cameo, right? Um, you know, I, I got proof sets and it doesn't look much different, but that's okay. Okay, interesting. And then here's another question. Uh, do you know if there are any tokens, medals, or coins from the other two uh, expeditions, Red River and Pike. And I, I know that we have some Pike medals in our collection. Obviously, he's kind of a big deal here in Colorado Springs. And I know that we have some medals uh, celebrating Zebulon Pike. But uh, do you know of any, Phil? So I know that there are pieces celebrating Pike. Uh, I don't know of the Red River expedition was sort of a failure. It uh, uh, they got sent packing. They were not out in the field very long. So I don't know that anything was celebrated for them. So Bill Williams is telling me that the good acre coins are struck with different dyes and finished in the circulating coin. Very good. Thank you, Bill. What else? Who else? You know of uh, any like uh, kind of key dates on the Sac on the Sacagawea coins that would command more uh, money, Phil? Oh, 
none of them command a lot of money, but there is some of the 2000 coins, um, you know, certified at high end that are worth a considerable uh, amount of cash. I can't remember if it's a 2000 D or just a 2000 um, from Philadelphia. One of the two of them uh, uh, in like min 67, et cetera, is worth some, some bucks. Anything else for Phil, everybody? Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, all of our e-learning presentations are eventually put on YouTube and online. So um, check out uh, if you, if you want to re-watch this or any of Phil's presentations. Uh. I've seen, I, in fact, <laughs> we actually have one of those Cheerios boxes in our collection downstairs. So I have seen what you're talking about with that. They marketed them with, it, it is Cheerios, right? We have one of those boxes of cereal. <laughs> so yeah, I don't okay. know what talking about there. Uh, do pieces uh, from the 2004 Lewis and Clark set uh, bring a premium is we have here? Not that I really know of. They, uh, you know, they make so many of the proof sets. It's, you can get more for a proof set by breaking it apart and selling the original items, but they don't command a big, a big dollar. Well, folks, um, I guess that concludes our presentation today. Thank you, Phil, as always, for your uh, numismatic insight, and thanks for all of you for joining us. Again, I have to give a shout out to the Gray Sheet for their continued sponsorship of our e-learning program. Also, I'm going to uh, take this time to do a little bit of uh, PR and marketing. Um, as most of you are probably aware, our in-person summer seminar is back on for 2022 after a two-year hiatus. And I don't know if anybody out there has been to one of our summer seminars, but if not, please join us this year. We're really looking forward to it, getting back in the swing of things and stay on the campus of Colorado College. Uh, immerse yourself in, in numismatics. Uh, it's always a great time. And um, uh, we really encourage you to uh, come out and uh, uh, we'll get to meet you. And then also uh, our summer show is in uh, Rosemont, Chicago this year. August 16th through the 20th. So hopefully you can join us at our annual World's Fair of Money. Again, thanks, Phil. And Phil's going to be at Summer Seminar, I assume. Yes, so I, will, I am. I will see you next month, Phil. Very good. I, have, I will see you then. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Appreciate right. it.